Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to AI for Good. My name is Bastian Kwas of the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and it is my privilege to introduce today's webinar, Living with AI, Past, Present and Future, featuring Jan Jun Ku, Director of the Standard Division at GV Media, Leonardo Chiaglione, CEO at CEDEO.net, Xiao Fai Dong, General Manager of the Nanjing Research Institute on Next Generation Artificial Intelligence, Yong Xiao, Professor at the School of Electronic Information and Communications at Wangzhou University of Science and Technology, and moderated by Wang Zhang, Director of Machine Vision Standardization and Strategy at CAICT, the China Telecom Research Institute. For today's session, we're counting on your active participation. For that, we have the Q&A functionality, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Please post any questions that you have to the panel there, and they will ask by, be asked by the moderator. Additionally, there is the chat functionality, which you can use to communicate with other participants. Please make sure to send your message to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can send, see your message. And you can find that selection option just above the messaging box itself. With that, it's now time for me to hand it over to our moderator for today, Juan. Hi, how are you? Hi, Bastian. Uh, thank you very much. So hello, everyone. I'm very glad to welcome all to today's AI for Good panel on Living with AI, Past, Present, and Future. I'm Yuan Zhang from China Telecom, and thanks ZTE for having me here. And it's a real pleasure to facilitate today's session, which is the fourth and last of a series of four episodes organized by ZTE and curated by a steering committee comprising uh, Wang Xiyu, the executive Vice President, Chief Technology Officer and Chief Information Officer of ZTE, and Dr. Gao Wen, the Director of Pengcheng Laboratory, and Ibrahim Hadid, the Executive Director of Linux AI and Data Foundation. Uh, so today we have four panelists with us, which Bastian has just introduced them, and we will ask each of them several questions regarding different aspects of AI, and also have them answer to our audience questions. Uh, so first, please allow me to welcome all of our panelists. So today we have uh, Dr. Ya Junko with us. Uh, so Dr. Uh, ya Junko is the is the technical advisor of TIAA, the director of standard division of Global Fusion Media Technology and Development Corporation. Let me see if Yajun Ko uh, can uh, open your video now to say hi to everybody. Hello, uh, everyone. I'm uh, very glad to attend this uh, question and uh, answer sessions. And uh, today, I actually attended this meeting on behalf of TIAA and uh, TIAA's Industry Alliance, uh, which is to promote the application of information technology to automotive and uh, transportation industry. So TIA is also a member of ITU, and recently we have been working with question 27 and study group 16 on the standardization of uh, vehicle multimedia systems. So last year in August, uh, the first uh, uh, ITUT recommendation, which is uh, F.749.3 had been published with focus on the use case and requirements of vehicle multimedia systems. And uh, currently we're working on the second standard which is uh, with, with focus on the architecture of uh, vehicle multimedia systems. And uh, again, I'm very glad to meet you guys on the web today. Thank you, Mr. Yuan. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are really glad to have you here and your uh, uh, resulting the standardization uh, in the industry are very remarkable. And I've noticed that you have been uh, working in the field of wireless and communication and multimedia signal processing for more than 20 years and has published more than 30 papers in notable referred journals and conferences, and also the inventor of more than 30 US and Chinese patents. Uh, it's really uh, remarkable and uh, welcome to be here and thank you, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And next I will introduce Dr. Leonardo uh, Kriglian. Uh, Dr. Leonardo Kriglian uh, graduated from the uh, Poly uh, 
technique of Turing and obtained his doctor's degree from the University of Tokyo. And Leonardo has always been at the front, uh, forefront of several initiatives that have helped shape the multimedia technology and business as we know today. And last September, uh, Leonardo has created MPI, the moving picture audio and data coding by uh, artificial intelligence, a nonprofit organization developing AI enabled data coding standard, which uh, bridges the gap between standards and the practical uses. And Leonardo is also the uh, founder of MPEG standard committee and chaired for 32 years, uh, Dr. Leonardo. Welcome. Uh, hi, uh, Yuan. Thank you for uh, the invitation to attend uh, this panel. Um, it is a great opportunity because uh, AI is indeed uh, the technology that uh, uh, could become uh, the common technology that will uh, drive uh, uh, industry and the services uh, in, in the future. Uh, because uh, I'm convinced of that, as you said, uh, it was not uh, just last uh, um, uh, September, but it was uh, September 2020 that um, I proposed, uh, and uh, with a number of companies, uh, we established uh, the, uh, the Empire uh, um, Association, and uh, which, by the way, is, uh, is located in Geneva. I mean, uh, we, we, we all meet... Uh, uh, virtually, but uh, the, we we are in Geneva. Um, in uh, in fifteen months, uh, we have produced the five standards, and uh, some of that uh, some of them have um, have already been published. We have uh, uh, many more uh, in in progress. Um, we take uh, the approach that uh, when you want to do deal standard to deal with standards, you have to use uh, a unifying technology to assess the standard. So you cannot think of using AI for, for video and then uh, AI for uh, human and machine communication. AI, AI is a pervasive enabling technology. Like I did uh, in, uh, in MPEG when uh, I was the first to say, stop with the video standards that are industry-based and country-based and let's take universal video coding standards. In the same way, I say AI should be taken as the basis of uh, all data coding applications. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Leonardo, for being here with us. And thanks for your contributions over the years to the multimedia industry. And we really look forward for well, how MPI will shape the uh, multimedia and AI world for us. Thank you very much. And uh, in the next speaker I'll introduce is Dr. Uh, Xiaofei Dong. Dr. Dong is General Manager of Nanjing Research Institute of Next Generation uh, Artificial Intelligence and a member of SAC TC28, SC42. Uh, and Dr. Dong has a deep understanding of AI standard system and has participated in the formulation of many international standards in ITUT and IEEE-SA and also Chinese AI standards. Uh, Dr. Dong, would you like to open your video? And uh, you have written several uh, research reports on AI and owns a number of patents related to AI and are uh, focusing on the uh, research and industrial application of all to uh, machine learning, cognitive intelligence, and hyper automation and other AI technologies. Welcome, Dr. Dong. Hey, Mr. Zhang, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Xiaofei Dong from NGAI, uh, one research institute in Nanjing, China. The NGAI is, uh, is an academia member of ITUT, and uh, also it's my pleasure to join in this panel to discuss AI past, uh, present, and future with experts from all over the world. Uh, also, it is a great opportunity for me to learn more about AI in this uh, panel and hope everyone joining this panel can get useful information for themselves. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much for being here with us, and we look forward to your excellent thoughts and, and considerations later. Thank you very much. And uh, the last speaker I would like to introduce is Dr. Yong Xiao. Dr. Xiao is a professor in the School of Electronic Information and Communications. Hi, Dr. Xiao at the Hangzhou University of Science and Technology uh, in Wuhan, China, and also the associate group leader of the Network Intelligence Group of IMT 2030, the uh, 6G promoting group, and the vice director of 5G Verticals Innovation Laboratory jointly funded by Host Ericsson and China Mobile. And Dr. Tong, you have published uh, more than 80 uh, patents, uh, uh, no, 80 papers, and uh, also the associate editor of IEEE Transactions on Mobile Computing. So hi, Dr. Uh, Xiao, We're really glad to have you here. Thank you, and um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yong Xiao. I'm, uh, I'm from uh, Huazhong University of Science Technology uh, at Wuhan. And uh, Huazhong University uh, of Science Technology is actually a, a academic member of ITUT. And uh, we are currently, uh, uh, since we joined uh, in uh, 2019, uh, 19, uh, we have uh, currently leading uh, the efforts on two standardization um, activities. The first one is the requirements and reference architecture of uh, IoT and smart city uh, service based on a federated machine learning. And the other one is a, a, a ITUT technical report on uh, architectural framework for semantic communications for IoT and smart cities. And uh, we are actually uh, currently also uh, actively working at the um, IMT uh, 2030, uh, a 6G promotion group uh, uh, is uh, actually a consortium uh, uh, jointly founded by uh, uh, the leading academia universities and also the, the industry members. Uh, we have been uh, publishing uh, uh, two uh, white papers about uh, the network AI and also, uh, also the uh, native AI in the uh, 6G. Uh, so, uh, and it's very glad to, uh, to be here and um, thank you. And thank you very much. Really glad to have you here and also want to hear from your aspect. Uh, so let's begin today's panel discussion. Uh, first, let's have a warm up question. Uh, so what's the difference between today's AI and the previous AI? Uh, so uh, we would like to hear first from uh, Dr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Yuan. Uh, so basically, according to DAPA's perspective, there are three waves of artificial intelligence. The first wave of AI is corrupted knowledge, uh, which may include the rule-based AI system. In this way, we define the rules for the intelligence machines and they follow the rules. So basically, those machines that follow rules which made or defined by a human. While well, the second wave of AI is statistical learning, which includes intelligent machines by using the statistical method. To me, uh, it includes all machine learning techniques that relying on the machines to define rules by clustering, classification, and use those math models to predict and make decisions. So currently is in the third wave of AI, which is a conceptual adaptation. In the third wave, intelligent machines will perceive and understand the world on its own and learn by understanding the world and reason with it. So basically, oh, okay. So basically, let me see. So basically uh, from the first wave to the current third wave, we can see that with the aid of the increased computing power and also with the advancement of the algorithms, the intelligence, the level of intelligence and automation has been improved quite a lot. That's my humble opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Then let's hear from Dr. Leonardo. Okay, sure. You want to say, is it the same question? Uh, yes, what's the difference between today's AI okay. and the previous AI? Uh, well, I'm, I will not go in depth uh, in the technology that, uh, of course, uh, drives uh, the, um, the difference uh, between uh, AI. But what I can say is that uh, um, uh, the difference is that uh, AI 
has already reached the masses, but it has reached the masses only on the surface. If you want to develop AI products, services, and application without the standards, it's costly because you have to bear the cost of developing all the components that you need. So the difference of, uh, of, of a technology is when uh, it is uh, applied uh, in a, a piecemeal fashion or it is applied uh, across the board. That uh, is what will make the difference. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, before I go to uh, Dr. Dong, I would like to ask all four panelists to open uh, your camera all the time, if that's okay with you, to let the audience see you all as we have this precious opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Then the same question, I would like to hear from Dr. Dong. Uh, thank you. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we can see from both in academia and the industry, AI is shifting from perceptual intelligence to cognitive intelligence. And uh, we can also see the AI related products or services uh, tend to be more and more smarter. Uh, for the technology using, uh, it's shifting from the single point to multi-model multi AI technology. Uh, specifically uh, to say, at the present, many research uh, fields of artificial intelligence are, cha are challenging from uh, cognitive intelligence, uh, such as image content understanding, semantic understanding, and uh, knowledge expression and reasoning. Uh, that's my answer. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Yong Xiao, please. Okay, thank you. So, um, Actually, the AI has been uh, already been there uh, for a quite a long time, and uh, actually since uh, like a hundred years ago, there's a lot of like sci-fi movies already full of artificial intelligent robots, and the people already having the basic idea about the, the main idea of AI is try to make the machine uh, more look like human beings. However, uh, actually, the AI is uh, really getting a, a real development at um, almost 30 years ago, uh, especially at 1956, uh, that is a famous uh, Dartmouth conferences. So um, actually uh, several uh, experts has formally defined AI as an attempt to find how to make a machine uh, use language, form abstractions and concepts and solve kinds of problems uh, now reserved for uh, humans and improve themselves. And uh, also the idea has been uh, raised for uh, like 60 years ago, there's still uh, uh, some great challenges uh, that making the AI uh, become only uh, become a really enjoying the fast development until recently. The main idea is that uh, during the past, the, the computing power is quite limited and also very expensive. And, and also the data at that time is still very limited. And uh, another thing is that the human has a, also a limit, very, very limited understanding of human brain and how human think by themselves, uh, including uh, both in the brain science and also the some other area. And until recently, uh, we have observing explosive growth on the AI across various fields. So um, the recent AI is uh, much more than just a, 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 a actually the, the original, uh, the recent AI is um, having a, a, a lot of uh, progress on several, several fields. And we have already uh, seen uh, in some very specific fields that AI can uh, provide comparable performance or even better performance compared to some of the great mind of human, human beings like the AlphaGo uh, and also some, uh, some of the AI trained models can even exceed in the capabilities on playing uh, Go games or et cetera. Um, uh, so basically, we uh, the modern AI has basically uh, on the track to release. Uh, so basically, approaching the original idea of AI that has been first introduced in the uh, sixty years ago. Uh, but of course, there are still a lot of uh, challenges. And uh, right now, uh, uh, since the AI has already enjoying uh, the, the fast development of the computing power, data sets, uh, explosive data, and also the the. Uh, the more improved understanding of human brains. So uh, we, we're definitely expecting and hope to see more uh, AI development and growth across a more diverse, uh, diverse uh, diversified uh, field. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. So we have uh, see uh, we have heard that uh, it's really different from previous AI. We have more data. Uh, we are concerning the cost and the resources, and we are uh, learning from the human brain and doing understanding and cognitive learning. And I uh, heard from uh, experts and mentioning there are uh, different waves of AI. Uh, so the next question is, what is the end of this wave of AI, and what will be the next? generation of AI look like? Uh, also want to ask uh, one by one. Uh, so Dr. Cole, please. Thank you, Mr. 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 Yuan. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm not sure what is the end of this wave, but uh, uh, for the next wave, I think the AI, besides of adapting to the world, I think the AI should have common sense and understand ethics. So the machine does not only learn, the machine has to have the capability, not only to learn from the environment, but also make decisions based on ethics, regulations, and follow the laws to avoid any misuse. Uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The, uh, Dr. Leonardo Kriglian, please. Uh, sorry, Leonardo, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, it is because uh, when uh, AI uh, is not uh, the exception compared to other technologies as it is today, but it is the norm that you can use it naturally, that you are assured that you can trust it, that it is accessible by many. So it should be a technology that many companies can access and not just a few. That you are assured that you can trust it, that is accessible, that, and there is a lot that you can do, that we must do to achieve that. I, uh, I have already mentioned the standards and uh, you should not expect any, anything less than, uh, than this from me. But standards are indeed something that is needed. What is uh, a standards in the AI field uh, may not be clear to all. I think that in Empire we do have, have an idea of what a standard uh, should be. Then uh, devices. I mean, if you want to have a really exciting AI, uh, you cannot expect it to do it uh, by by, by software or unless you want to rely on the cloud, but we have, a, we have some uh, uh, questions later about uh, energy consumption. Then the mindset of people using it, awareness. You should be aware that you are using it. And of course, a trust. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing with us. Then uh, Dr. Dong, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, for this question, uh, in my opinion, I think uh, the end of this generation of artificial intelligence will be reflected by three aspects. Uh, performance, uh, breakthrough, meet uh, bottlenecks, and engineering, uh, AI engineering is difficult to solve, and the ethical credibility hinders the development uh, process. And also for the next generation look like, I think the new generation artificial intelligence will take a new look. Firstly, uh, the coexistence of general purpose and special purposes. And also for the artificial intelligence technology covering multimodal, multilingual and the multi-fields will become the, uh, the infrastructure in the general field. And the artificial intelligence technology facing uh, practical industry and, and the specific things, uh, scenarios will continue to, uh, to extend its, uh, its fields. And also uh, the secondly, in-depth understanding of uh, language and uh, knowledge and the processing understanding and the generation of language will break through the level of symbols uh, change to content, semantics, and the context. Um, that's my opinion, Mrs. Zhang. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, then let's go to Dr. Xiao, please. 
And thanks for the questions. So um, actually the first, uh, we, we, we heard it uh, uh, called uh, the first wave uh, of AI is uh, actually originated from uh, several very limited fields. For example, the computer vision and natural language processing. Uh, so these, uh, a lot of algorithms is right now, uh, they, they can always source back to those uh, limited field and they have their limitations. Although they, they are having astounding uh, performance in some fields, but still, uh, right now, it's very difficult to find a general uh, AI models that can really uh, apply or extend it or directly used in a more wide variety um, of area. So um, that's, uh, that's actually a limit, uh, causing a lot of limitations on applying AI into a more uh, a general fields. So uh, that's the reason, uh, uh, this is one particular limit of AI. And the second one is uh, also uh, right now, a lot of AI built on the so-called uh, deep neural network um, uh, models. So it also has the limitations on explainable or how to use mathematical uh, framework to, uh, to basically predict its performance. So it can always output some probability. It always have some even small probability, but still even the best performance uh, AI models has small probabilities of outputting some bad results or uncontrollable results. So that might be causing a disaster, if, especially when we use it in a large scale uh, human uh, society, right? And also another thing is that the, uh, uh, the current one requires a lot of data to be uh, as uh, pre-collected and also be pre-trained at the either data set, uh, data, uh, cloud data centers or the, uh, for example, edge servers but still this data must be shared and transported throughout the network. That causing a lot of um, either a security problem or also ethical problems. So a lot of human beings have not aware of where their data has been used by a lot of uh, big companies, right? So, and, and uh, the final one is, uh, I do believe this uh, the called uh, limitations of the first generations of AI is uh, they basically ignores the consumption of resource. Uh, because um, actually a recent study has already been shown that the model training, a lot of uh, state-of-the-art model, uh, AI models, the training cost has been increased around over uh, 300,000 times from just five, uh, from 2012 to uh, 2017. So, which means that uh, the development of the current generations of AI solution is far from sustainable, right? Especially for, for uh, what, what will gonna happen in the future. So, um, that I believe that the future generation of AI, if we seriously want to make this continue, the AI to be continually expanding their applications in a much wider area and across more uh, diverse uh, human human life, we must address those problems. So, the, in other words, the AI model must be able to explain and also must be able to control. People must be able to understand uh, what is real uh, AI solutions about. Another one is that we do hope that some of the AI model can be reused or transferred instead of every time we're training new AI models with one uh, very particular uh, specific data, data sets, training data sets, right? And also the security issue must be addressed because uh, the, the, a lot of human users becomes more and more uncomfortable uh, about their uh, data privacy and how the data being used. So a lot of country has already been introduced in laws uh, to regulate the big, big companies to, to, uh, to basically using the data to train AI models. And finally, the, the, the resource. Uh, and, and, and actually the, uh, the AI models must be uh, carefully optimized by consideration of their, how much data, how much resource uh, must be consumed. So instead of just uh, basically consume a lot of uh, causing the, uh, emission problem or climate change problems. So uh, all this change uh, in order to make the AI uh, development to be more sustainable uh, must be addressed. So that's, that's my um, just on, on opinion. Uh, thank you. Hey, thank you. And thank you all very much. If to summarize in two words, that should be uh, accessible and sustainable, I think. Uh, so uh, to facilitate that AI uh, to be uh, adopted in industries and according to the traditional automation technologies, what are the added benefits that can result AI in verticals? Uh, I would like to hear from Dr. Cole first. 
So for this question, so uh, personally, I have some experience with the automotive industry. So I, I will focus on this industry. So beyond traditional industry automation, the ones to tools, uh, new generation of uh, autonomous systems appearing in areas ranging from the autonomous driving and on the road to automated, aut uh, automated uh, checkout machines in grocery stores. So application of technologies in this and other fields uh, could help tackle society challenges. For example, autonomous driving uh, vehicles pose a potential solution to some of the hardships that people living with disabilities face daily. So including lacking of accessible transportation to work and to hold a job. So in that sense, I think um, the benefit of AI uh, in transportation or in automotive industry could really help the people which need them most. Thank you, Ms. Yuan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then let's hear from Leonardo. Uh, sure. Uh, so this is uh, certainly a question. I, I believe I have opinions because, um, um, I mean, of course, uh, industry is made, is made of, of verticals. On the other hand, uh, when you have a technology transition like we are having today, then uh, vertical are, are difficult to support. So I want to take uh, something that goes back uh, 30 years uh, ago, um, the MP2 case when uh, all countries were um, uh, crazy about uh, uh, going digital with digital television, but uh, they didn't know how to do it. Uh, all countries could not decide. Japan had developed the Muse HDTV broadcasting system. Maybe we don't know, but not many remember uh, who it was, but uh, it had to step back when uh, MPEG-2 was globally uh, adopted. So again, my message is uh, watch the standards. Standards is what make things possible. And uh, not because I am against verticals, of course, I repeat, the verticals are, are how the business is, is based. But uh, verticals should, should learn uh, from uh, drawing useful technologies that are shared by different verticals. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for your answers. And then I'll ask the next question uh, that uh, based on the consideration uh, of the AI in verticals, uh, do you think it requires new business models to make it happen? Uh, also want to uh, hear from Dr. Cope first. And uh, again, so in automotive industry, the latest trends such as connectivity and uh, artificial intelligence I mean, the autom autom uh, autonomous driving will cause a shift in the value share. So basically the traditional leading OEMs uh, will still have a place in the market because many hardware components will re re remain the same, such as uh, engines, motors, and uh, et cetera. The software system, however, uh, will play a more vital uh, roles for high-tech cars. So in that sense, software uh, systems are both more expensive and more, uh, more vital for the for autonomous vehicle than hardware. And, the, and also they are considered more valuable by, by customers. So in this sense, it means that the tech companies uh, may contribute the most to an autonomous, uh, autonomous vehicle total value. So this will certainly change the landscape of this industry and also change the business model of various players in this field. Thank you, Ms. Jian. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Leonardo? Um, sure. Uh, when, when we talk about the business models, we, are, we talk about uh, um, probably the, the most exciting manifestation of human intelligence. So it's very hard to uh, say this will happen and this will not happen in the, in the business world. I would say on the other hand that not necessarily <coughs> um, AI will need a, a, a new business model. 
again taking uh, again uh, taking uh, the example of um, um, of what I've said before that uh, standards are can be made uh, part of an infrastructure um, then uh, um, vertical uh, have uh, um, better uh, take uh, the um, that, that standard and make that uh, infrastructure. So the, the basic message is, uh, which is not new, but uh, in the sense that uh, not necessarily you need business model is that uh, sharing development cost of what is common in the safer way. If you wanted to, you are a vertical and therefore you want to develop everything that uh, gets very costly, and that is not uh, um, and that is not the the way uh, verticals verticals can succeed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Xiaofei Dong, let's hear from you. Okay, thank you. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I think for the new uh, new generation of artificial intelligence, also the new business models should be offered. Uh, firstly, the solution uh, combined, combining with product plus service should be offered because we know uh, currently the application scenarios in the vertical fields are relative, uh, relatively complex. The existing products uh, are difficult to solve the fundamental needs and meet all the requirements. So. Uh, in this uh, way, in this situation, I think the the new solutions uh, for the new generation of artificial intelligence should be offered, and also for for the paying methods, uh, with, I think uh, there should be a new model uh, of paying by effect should be offered because after. Uh, artificial intelligence is combined with uh, specific business scenarios in uh, in lots of vertical fields. The fees can be charged according to, to the measurable volume it generates. Uh, for example, smart customer services uh, vendors measure the effect they saved and they can charge fees based on workloads. So uh, these two new models I think should be offered in the uh, new generation artificial intelligence. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for sharing on the uh, business model uh, in future uh, for AI in verticals. And who do you think will benefit the most uh, from this uh, new business model and uh, the verticals with AI? Uh, is it the vendors or the uh, automotive manufacturers or the end users or someone else? Uh, let me ask Dr. Cole first. Uh, well, uh, it's not quite easy to say who will benefit the most from the adoption of AI. Uh, in the automotive industry, the end user will definitely benefit from, the, from AI. With self-driving cars, they could free their hands and minds and simply turn the transportation tools into a living room on wheels. On the other hand, the latest trend in this industry will cause two major changes uh, for OEM and vendors. The first will affect the value chain. Previously, OEM was actually on top of the auto value chain, coordinating all other participants to produce a vehicle. But with autonomous cars, the value chain model will transform from pure, uh, pyramid to hub and spoke. So in short, uh, in this new order, OEM will lose their dominance and all participants um, actually of this value chain will become equal powers. So this equality is actually possible because other auto, uh, automotive industry players are better focused on its own field rather than you know the the integration of the product of the vehicle as a whole uh, as for the OEM. So, so in this sense, uh, so this is the first uh, uh, change. So the second change is actually a shift in the value share, which actually I briefly uh, reviews in the answer to the uh, previous question. 
So for basically uh, the software companies will play a vital role in the future autonomous vehicle uh, production. So as a result, the tech companies, uh, mobility providers, and also the new OEM like Tesla or you know, something like that, are creating serious competition for traditional OEMs. And uh, uh, since autonomous vehicle depend on software even more than on hardware, so tech, company, tech companies can take the lead. Uh, with that being said, uh, the race for autonomous uh, cars is a team competition. So to stay competitive in this uh, market, the OEMs, the vendors, and also the tech companies have to work together and provide solutions for customers. Uh, and for now, many companies have already found their teammates uh, from other industry. So as we know, um, so this competition is uh, long run. So for now, uh, nobody knows who is going to win the autonomous race, uh, car race. Uh, however, we, we, can, we do know that it won't be a single player. So only a team that consider, that's consists of a traditional auto manufacturers and, the, and also the uh, uh, partners which focus, uh, with focus tech professionals can overcome the challenge for, this, uh, for the auto, automotive industry and bring innovative technology and solutions to the market. And that's my view. Thank you, Ms. Nguyen. Okay, thank you for sharing with us. And Dr. Craig Lian. Okay, um, it is uh, kind of easy to talk about technology, uh, especially infrastructure technology, technologies, but uh, it is always terribly complicated to make guesses about uh, how business will evolve. Uh, for sure, AI uh, is a game changer. Um, the, uh, the business, many businesses, I, I like the, the analysis of the uh, automotive market. Um, so uh, it, it, will, uh, it will certainly be completely shuffled. Um, there will be differences between businesses. Um, so let me take the example of uh, con con Connected automotive vehicles, which is uh, one of the major uh, standards that we are addressing. Uh, we have defined uh, a, a reference model where we, we have subdivided uh, the components down to, to the atomic level and uh, defining um, the components, defining the function of the components, the interfaces, and the formats of the data uh, in and out of these components. So if you have that, and if uh, industry follows, then you can have a component market. So then, uh, yeah, sure, we have, uh, then we are talking about OEMs. And that, uh, that is an interesting one because uh, you, can, uh, you can apply um, expertise, the US specific expertise to a component and make it uh, the best in, uh, in the industry and you don't have to concentrate on other components where you don't have sufficient uh, competence. I think the component market is, uh, is vital uh, for the future. And uh, it will take years before a connected automotive market will emerge in the sense that uh, a market makes sense when we are talking uh, about at least hundreds of millions of, of devices. They are... Um, Companies who think that they can do everything in house, they will start uh, uh, selling uh, to the uh, top market and gradually go down. Yeah, that maybe is the way uh, industry will evolve. I would think that uh, for humankind, it is more interesting if we can quickly replace existing technologies with connected autonomous vehicles. Hey, thank you very much for sharing with us. So regarding who will benefit most, maybe the answer is we will see, but hopefully it will benefit the whole value chain. And then uh, consider all the benefits. Uh, also want to uh, ask a question to hear from you about the environment. Uh, well, the share of aeration in global uh, carbon dioxide emissions is estimated at around 2.5% 
but almost 4% of all carbon dioxide emissions are now uh, attributable to global data transfer and its infrastructure. And how can we use machine learning and AI to optimize vertical, verticals for saving energy and therefore reducing carbon dioxide emission instead of increasing them or other cases that benefit mankind? Uh, also want to hear from Dr. Cole first. Well, uh, Ms. Yuan, uh, so <laughs> I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, to my best guess, so by using the artificial intelligence technologies, we can monitor the activity of the uh, factories, which have uh, more uh, emissions. And also we can, uh, to my best guess, uh, I think the, this technology can also be used to help people to plant more trees. Uh, that's my 10 cents. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Kriglian, please. Okay, so this is, um, this is uh, indeed a, an interesting question and I congratulate you on, on raising this one. Uh, again, I am I'm not, uh, I'm not competent like my, uh, my predecessor uh, in, uh, in giving uh, um, uh, firm opinions about this. What I can say is that uh, uh, if we take uh, um, carbon-based human thinking, is energy hungry? So uh, the brain is uh, about a 2% of a person's weight, but it consumes 20% of the total energy consumed by a human when it does a typical uh, physical activities. Um, so um, I, I, we have a group in Empire that uh, considers uh, two different types of, of uh, uh, using AI for video coding. Uh, I will certainly propose that to make a study and uh, make a comparison of the energy consumption that you achieve with state-of-the-art uh, uh, technology today and uh, what is the energy that you will consume uh, using AI technology? I'm very curious of the answer myself. And if you are interested, I will certainly be happy to share that information with you. Okay, thank you. I really want to uh, hear from that. And uh, then uh, let's hear from Dr. Xiao. Did you mean me or uh, Dr. Dong? Uh, maybe Dr. Dong first, uh, both okay. okay, thank you. Okay, okay. okay. I can uh, simply answer this question. So uh, in my opinion, I think uh, the artificial intelligence can help uh, to reduce the CO2 in many ways. Uh, firstly, uh, artificial intelligence plays a central and a coordinate role in the construction of small low carbon cities just like the brain to the body uh, actually in small low uh, carbon manufacturing it has achieved uh, energy efficiency improvements and also uh, in our important links such as design production operation and maintenance uh, testing and logistics in many fields uh, also, for the software related to the artificial intelligence uh, or based on artificial intelligence technology, such as robotic process automation, uh, intelligent customer service, and robots, uh, etc., uh, these this products or services have taken the lead in many fields, such as finance, communications, and the manufacturing, and also transportation. And this uh, software software uh, can greatly improve the efficiency of business operations. Uh, in another way, it can reduce the CO2 emission. And also uh, for the machine learning and the intelligent analysis, it also can uh, reduce the CO2 uh, by, uh, by combining different technology and by uh, 
increasing the efficiency and uh, also for uh, for the forecast of the in the other ways. So uh, I think uh, artificial intelligence can help us to get to achieve the carbon neutrality. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Then it's your turn, Dr. Xiao. Okay, um, thank you for the questions. Actually, um, I do believe this question is uh, more complicated than uh, it appears. Um, actually, um, at uh, uh, Harding University of Science Technology, uh, uh, we have the uh, national uh, international collaboration uh, research center of green communication networks. Um, that basically we we are focusing on uh, just try to introduce uh, the so-called green communication networks by reducing the emission of the entire uh, uh, communication systems. Uh, our recent study found that actually, if you just simply apply uh, the state of the art AI technology to, for example, optimize the network, the, the, the optimization solution probably could be improved. However, it actually introduced more energy consumption and also uh, require more uh, resource consumption uh, that causing actually uh, even more uh, uh, like emission and a lot of issues. So uh, that's actually uh, uh, the academia has already uh, recently raised the voice by, uh, by uh, suggesting that uh, most of the uh, traditional AI uh, conferences and uh, recent AI models, they don't really publish on uh, how much energy consumption or how much computational uh, resource they require. They simply reporting that okay, how much performance has been improved to the to their models? So it's actually uh, it's not a sustainable way. Uh, so recent trends in the academia have been uh, actually uh, we have uh, raising the voice by uh, suggesting that in all uh, or most of the AI uh, future work about AI uh, algorithms and solutions. Uh, so we should also uh, include some of the, for example, environmental. Uh, influ influences or impact, as well as uh, uh, energy consumption, computational power required uh, to achieving a certain improvement on the performance. In other words, how much cost uh, will be uh, required uh, for the slight improvement or some improvement uh, by introducing AI? So uh, it's actually, um, we are, uh, these we believe uh, will be uh, eventually causing the AI to be uh, applied in more uh, diversified verticals in a more sustainable way. Okay. That's my uh, own opinion. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, really glad to know that the experts are considering uh, technologies like green light computing and also uh, new metrics uh, in terms of environmental protection. Uh, it's really uh, uh, icon that, that AI has been uh, maturing some extent. And then uh, as just several experts have mentioned about ethics aspect of AI, uh, we would also like to hear from you uh, that do you see any ethical issues in data acquisition for AI? Uh, let's hear from uh, Dr. Craig Lam first. Um, so, um, you say uh, concerns uh, about uh, data acquisition uh, for AI. My issue is not so much in data acquisition, but uh, because, you know, you acquire data because you have a particular use. Uh, the concern is, uh, is more about how the data uh, are used. So if you are using a, a machine that has been trained uh, with biased data, because that was your initial uh, application domain, then uh, you may not uh, serve uh, uh, the next goal because it is, a, it is different. So um, in uh, this uh, ethical considerations are one of the uh, key elements that we have so in, we have a system whereby uh, we appoint uh, uh, assessors, independent assessors, uh, who test uh, implementation uh, against bias. And uh, then uh, it qualifies uh, the implementation for a particular domain, but not for others. 
What is important is that uh, uh, end users are uh, aware of uh, how the machine that they are interacting with has been trained. So ethical concerns are at the basis of AI, but we should put to the right target. And uh, we should also investigate solutions. So we have one and uh, we are implementing it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and then let's hear from Dr. Uh, Yong Xiao, please. Okay, um, thank you for the questions. Actually, uh, uh, about the data um, is always been a central issue in the um, uh, in the ethics of using AI in different fields. Uh, for example, uh, right, right now, uh, actually, a lot of big company has been using the data sets to train a model uh, without uh, notifying the users. And uh, th there are some progress. Uh, for example, the EU has already introduced new laws to uh, basically uh, avoiding some of the data. Uh, being uh, transferred or used by uh, into the data center and being trained. Um, but there are some of the new models, for example, the federated learning, distributed learning, allowing the data does not really uh, uh, removing uh, from the users, uh, still uh, keep, uh, keep local, but still uh, be able to train in the model. Uh, another uh, progress on, on this one is that uh, we're also introducing uh, some of the uh, ways of evaluating uh, some of the, for example, contribution or usefulness of, the, of some data. Uh, so that is also uh, is quite important because uh, uh, the people will be able to choose whether or not they accept uh, some of the less personalized model. They accept some general uh, AI models uh, to be applied to their phones, to their daily lives, instead of uh, they, if they're willing to review some private data, they could be able to have some benefits by have some uh, like uh, personalized uh, AI models that can be tailored to, to more of their uh, daily usage. So the people will, will hopefully the, the people will have the choice. Uh, then there will be uh, probably another way to address this issue. And, and also the, uh, some of the uh, recent study in the academia, we, we're talking about the transfer learning. We try to reuse some of the same model instead of always using the data, uh, always requiring new data to train. We can use in some of the old data uh, that has already been trained and just do some modification uh, uh, without violating the data acquisition. So uh, these are some of the uh, recent efforts uh, that try to address, uh, could have the potential of leading uh, the, uh, to, uh, to address uh, some solutions of the ethical issues on the data acquisition in the AI. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for your answers for this question. Uh, so we uh, might have issues, but we will have solutions in different aspects. Uh, okay, then uh, I see uh, there's no uh, not much time left and we will give the opportunity uh, for the audience. Uh, I'll ask the questions that uh, on the Q&A uh, board. Uh, so first question is that, uh, will AI steal our job in the future? Uh, my friend is a handcraft worker. So uh, it's a general question. Who, who would like to answer it? Um, maybe uh, Dr. Dong, would you like to answer this question? Uh, of course, uh, I can simply answer this question. So many people will ask about this question, will AI steal our jobs? Will AI replace our jobs? And uh, so in my opinion, uh, I think AI may, I will not be steal our jobs, but AI may be replace some jobs. Uh, for example, uh, if, uh, if the handcraft and with uh, AI a robot, it may need more knowledge but it, may, it can uh, give the handicraft uh, more efficiency. So uh, in my opinion, I think uh, the AI can help, uh, can help us to be more efficient, but AI will not uh, steal or replace our jobs. That's my opinion. 
Okay, thank you for your answers. It seems uh, optimistic. And uh, then let me uh, conclude with one uh, more question from our audience. Uh, that is most questions seem to be about the benefits of AI. Do you have any concerns of the risks of AI? For example, it will take people's jobs. Uh, what can we do about it? Uh, seems related, who would like to answer this question? And I, I can uh, say a few words. Um, so actually, I think every new technology, when it merges, will always be a two-edged sword, right? It, uh, on one hand, always introduces some benefits to a lot of people. But on the other hand, it always uh, requires uh, some of the old job or old uh, the people has to change their mind. Uh, but actually, I do believe the AI brings more opportunity uh, than some of the bad uh, effects. Right, because AI actually allowing people to change their mind. There are still a lot of ways that AI cannot do a better job than human race. And uh, the AI still needs to mimic the human uh, reasoning and human skills, uh, still have to learn from the human, human race. So in other words, the AI, uh, I, I do personally believe the AI will create more job and more opportunities uh, for people instead of, instead of just, uh, just steal their job, it actually create more jobs uh, as long as uh, a lot of uh, the people still have to change their mind and uh, be open mind about the new technology. Uh, that, that's my own, own opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the time is really limited. Uh, so I want to say, uh, say thank you all very much and uh, for all the four speakers for the excellent discussion. And we will be concluding. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this was the last of a series of four webinars, uh, but the AI for Good programming continues. So please check out the AI for Good webpage and hope to see you next time. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone. Uh, bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you, one, and thank you also to all our speakers today. Um, we hope that you have enjoyed the webinar, and we're launching a quick poll that you can use to um, express this. Uh, it has helpful smiley faces. Smiley faces. So please let us know. Uh, I'd also like to mention a few more things that are coming up. So this afternoon we have. Uh, Trustworthy AI, our next installment with uh, Cynthia Rudin, a professor of computer science at Duke University. Uh, you can find the description of the session and the link to the registration page in the chat. Uh, additionally, we have upcoming seminars still this month before uh, the end of the year with uh, AI and health, as well as on climate. We have several interesting sessions starting in January again. Um, please have a look at the chat for more links and also check out our website where you can find all sessions at aiforgood.itu.int. All previous sessions also are available on YouTube. Uh, I have also added the link in the chat, so please have a look if there's something that you have seen or something that you're interested. We have many playlists where you can see related topics. With that, I think we've reached the end of the webinar for today. I'd like to once again thank everybody, our uh, speakers today at today's roundtable, our moderator, Yuan. Uh, partners, ZTE, sponsors, and our co-convener, Switzerland. And uh, thank you very much, and we hope to see you soon. See you. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector.
Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. 